Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to church. Our announcements for today. Uh, don't forget the church barbecue is going to be August 7th uh, after the 11 a.m. service, so everybody come on out for that. Make sure you pick up the women's advance cards. Invite some ladies, you know, to the uh, the thing that's going on. Pastor Ruby's going to be doing that. I think that's what, September? September. September. Um, as always, Grateful Food uh, Pantry donations go in the... Uh, uh, fellowship Hall, the Word for You Today devotional, grab them, hand them out, and download the app. Amen? Amen. 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 <sighs> oh, these things are all, it's got me all twisted here. Um, let's open up a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word, Father. Use me as your vessel to get your message out there. Open up the hearts of your people to receive it and just touch them in a very special way. Father, thank you. Just thank you for all these things. We love you. We honor and praise you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. So this morning, we're going to talk about truth, justice, and the American way as we get ready to go into July 4th weekend. <sighs> Given what's going on, I mean, this past week's been a little crazy, right? With these uh, decisions that came out of the Supreme Court. Given what's been going on, I figured we'd probably want to talk about some of that stuff a little bit this morning and get a biblical perspective. But, does everybody know where this saying comes from? Truth, justice, and the American way? Everybody remember that? Superman. Yeah. This actually came about on the, the uh, radio show. They did this, they came up with this slogan in the early days of World War II that Superman started to do this. It was to basically bolster patriotism and get them on board with the war effort. <clears throat> like I said, it was on the radio, but eventually it made it to the com uh, comic books too. And uh, this, the use of this phrase actually became, well, it fell out of popularity around 1993. They started to remove it from the comic books and, and it, you didn't hear it spoken of as much. And the reason why was because the idea of the American way began to fall out of favor. In, in light of the recent Supreme Court decisions this past week, you can see how true that really is. Now, there's another side to that and I'll get to that in a minute. But you're beginning to see how these people are beginning to freak out. And they want what the traditional idea of the American way, you know, our idea of what it was, um, to fall out of favor. Because they want to institute their idea of what the American way is. And we're going to look at the biblical perspective of what the American way really, really is. We see all this rioting, looting, and everything that's going on, the lawlessness that's going on, because the nation has not only had the sense of itself fade away, but it seems to be almost dying at this point. And these people are really trying to push that narrative. And it's died because of the people have allowed the truth of God's word to fall from their minds much less be spoken through their lips. Now, where does that come from? Well, let's look at this scripture first. We've all heard it, and you've heard this scripture before because I've spoken of it many times. Take a look at Deuteronomy 6. Let's start in verse 4. We actually talked about this, I think it was last week or the week before. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now, before we go on, I want to share something with you there. You see here in verse 5, it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Where's your spirit, man, reside? In your heart. With all your soul. What is your soul? I've told you guys many times. It's your mental faculties. And with all your strength, where do we get our strength from? Right? This flesh, our body, this idea. So when you think about this, you're to love the Lord your God with your heart, your spirit, with your mind, your soul, and with all your flesh. Meaning everything that you're made up of, this is how you should love your God. Everything you got should be given to Him. Verse 6, And these words which I command you today shall be in your, where? In your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. 
Look what he says here. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Always on your mind, always before your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, some people may be watching online, or somebody may even be thinking you here. Oh, pastor, that's for Israel. It just says, it says, hero Israel. Well, another scripture I reference quite a bit, we find in Psalm 33 and verse 12. What does this one say? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. That word we hear a lot in this church, don't we? Inheritance, we're grafted in. We get all the promises, all the blessings of the Old Testament with none of the curses because Jesus did away with all that. How awesome is that? But blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Well, when we founded this nation, I say we, but when our founding fathers founded this nation, they were rooted in his word. They were securely rooted in his word. I've reminded you guys of this over and over again. But that inheritance thing means us. All right? And here's the thing. As a nation, we wonder why the, the, the train is coming off the rails. As a nation, we have failed to keep his commandments. As a nation, we failed to keep his word before our eyes. We have failed as parents. I'm not saying we as in we. I'm saying as in a whole. We failed as parents and even worse have failed as a church at large. Think about it. Think about it. We see the watered-down gospel get out there, and it's crazy with what we see going on. And God gave these commandments to Moses that we find here, right? And he, they were to be followed to the letter. And what you see going on right now is a byproduct of that failure. You know, those that are sitting here on, or uh, sitting here in the in the church, or those who may be watching online, those who truly believe. I believe that we've been chosen for this very purpose, for this time that we live in. You know, you've all been chosen for such a time as this. You've heard me say that many times. I don't know if many of you know where that scripture reference is found, but it's found in Esther 4, in verse 13 and 14. It says, And Mordecai told uh, them to answer, Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So what does that mean on June 26th in the year 2022? How do we apply that to our lives now? What it means is this. Don't think for one second that anyone is going to escape what is coming. All right? And I'm saying that in a good way, and I'm saying that in a bad way. Those of us who believe we continue to try to bring more people into the fold, to get more people to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but if you're silent, you are giving consent to the evil that is growing in this nation. If you remain silent, God's word and his will is going to come to pass, guys. But here's the thing. If you're remaining silent, you don't ever want to get to heaven and hear these words. Where were you? Think about it. Where were you? We want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Do we not? If Jesus said to you, where were you? What's he asking you about? The plan that he had for your life, is not. not? Where were you? Were you quiet? Or were you out there talking about Jesus? And this, you know, who knows? Maybe, just maybe you were born into the kingdom for such a time as this. Guys, I believe that there's a reason why those of us who are here now, in this world right now, have a calling. We all have a calling, but we have a very special calling. With what we see going on in the world right now, I can't believe that Jesus is very far off. And there's a reason why. The sin is out there. It's always been out there. But now, nations, individuals, but especially as nations, they're beginning to revel in that sin. They don't even see it as sin anymore. It's just what they want and what they do. And that reminds me of what the Holy Spirit wanted me to tell everybody. I think this was Wednesday night. 
you know, if you weren't here, you didn't catch it online, you might want to write this down, or you can see me after service and we can get it to you. But what we were talking about was how seeing is believing, okay? We were talking about how doubting Thomas, after Jesus had been crucified, when Jesus had shown himself to the disciples, what did Thomas say when they told him? He said, unless I see it with my own eyes or put my hands in the holes, I will not believe. This presented a very real problem to the gospel, to the ministry of Jesus Christ. Why? Because one of his own, one of the twelve, was saying, I will not believe. But he wanted to see it. And what did Jesus say about this after he had talked to Thomas? And he had him stick his hands in the holes that were in his hands and feet and on his side. And he said, you know, you believe because you see. Blessed are those who believe and haven't seen. Okay? And the Holy Spirit had me put this down. It was kind of difficult to get it out because it's a little bit of a tongue twister. And what he said to me was this. Seeing is believing, or maybe it isn't. But maybe, just maybe, if we don't see, we truly see. And those who see won't ever see the truth, but rather the lie. And not only see the lie, but embrace it, and not only embrace it, revel in the lie. See, that's what we see going on in the world right now. They are reveling in the lies of Satan. And they have no intention of coming away from it. They love it. See, but we've been born for such a time as this. You've been chosen to see. You've been chosen to have your eyes open to the supernatural nature of what is going on in the world right now. You've been, you've been chosen to see through the lie and embrace the truth. Amen? Have we not? We have. You've been chosen to embrace truth Justice in the American way. Why? Because the American way, the true American way, is God's way. And we're going to show you that this morning through some quotes from our founding fathers, through scripture. I'll show you some scriptural references. And I'm going to make a hard statement right now, guys. Uh, at this point, I, I just don't even care anymore whether it upsets anybody. Time is short. I have to tell you what I have to tell you. And it is what it is. These people, those people in this nation who do not embrace God's word and his will are not embracing the American way. They're embracing the devil's way, the world's way. You can either serve God or serve the enemy. And here's a hard truth. If you do not make the conscious decision to ask Jesus Christ in your heart to be your Lord and be your Savior... You serve the enemy by default. It's just the way it is. People have a hard time with that. What do they what do they say? But I'm a what person? Good person. Well, we know what the Bible says about good people, right? What did Jesus say? There was only one. That's good. And it didn't say it was John Smith. It didn't say it was uh Joey Two Gun Tumanillo. I don't know. Whoever it might be, right? <clears throat> the way of the world, the way of the devil, only leads to one place, and that's destruction. And sadly, that is where they want to drag this nation. We are divided now. Look, look at what's going on. We are divided now, right down the middle, it seems, in such a way. People have been talking lately, even more so the past couple weeks, we have never seen division in a nation like this since the Civil War. It might even be greater right now than when, when we saw the Civil War. In recent years, we've seen the chipping away of our freedoms, and we're beginning to see how people react. We're seeing how God's people react and how the devil's people react. It's a stark contrast, is it not? It's a big, big difference. There's really no other way to put it, guys. You know, either you stand with God or you fall with Satan. That's it. That's it. Those are your two choices. It is really that simple. See, but with these recent Supreme Court decisions, we see, though, that there's a patriotic whisper in the air. Did you see what they're doing to Judge uh, Clarence Thomas? You see how they're, they're going after him? 
Because he didn't end in that decision for Roe v. Wade. He actually said that maybe the Supreme Court should begin to look at other decisions that have been made about gay rights. Or uh, marriage, what is it? Gay marriage or whatever it was. And what was the other one? Contraception and stuff like that. They want to impeach him. They want to impeach him from the Supreme Court. Why? Because he's speaking the truth? You know, I saw an interview with, uh, with uh, the left's justice there, uh, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You know, these people are carrying on about the Roe v. Wade decision. Now, Christians look at this as a, a victory. And it is. It is. It is a victory. But uh, Justice uh, Ginsburg was being interviewed, and this was in 2013, and she said this. The Supreme Court never should have weighed in on the Roe v. Wade case in the first place. It was never a constitutional right. It's not in the Constitution. I actually had a, a woman say to me the other day, and she didn't know. It's okay. She said, no. She's like, she's like Kyle, that's a, that's a constitutional right. It's one of the amendments, the idea of abortion. And I said, no, it's not. She had referenced how they said, or that how they had referenced the 14th Amendment when they had made this decision. But see how people can get something and just get it so wrong and twisted? Why? Because they're being pushed a narrative, and it's a narrative that's not true. You know, people even want to hide this one. In world, uh, I think it was actually before World War II. It might even have been in his book. Hitler wrote and talked about, if you lie enough and push that lie, People will believe it, and it'll begin to become accepted as the truth. Now, nowadays, what do they try to tell you? He never said that. It's amazing how history is beginning to disappear, isn't it? I'm going to get to that a little bit today, too. Like I said, we've seen the chipping away of our freedoms. Guys, I'm telling you right now, what you've seen go on in the past, it's crazy how we're now in 2022, right? The pandemic is now two years old, and it seems like it's been just such a long ride but they've been chipping away at our freedom slowly for a lot longer than that. But you have to understand something. <laughs> Through this whisper of patriotism that we're beginning to see, this whisper of what it truly means to be an American, you know, I have to ask, are those whispers a reflection of the Founding Fathers' reverent fear of the Lord? Or is it because these people are now doing it because they want to push their own agendas? Ask yourself these questions. You have to ask yourself these questions. Look, when we started ICC, I've been preaching the same thing since the first day we opened this church. It is what it is. God has told me he's called me for this specific reason. To keep you guys informed and understand the biblical principles being applied to what we see go on today. So understand this. You are going to begin to see a bunch of bandwagon jumpers within the church. Be careful. Be careful. I told you about what uh, that pastor said about how he tried to kick the lefties and the Democrats out of his church. Shame on him. Shame on him. See, our job as ministers is to preach the gospel to whoever will hear it. To everybody. Whether they hear it or not, that's between them and God. Whether they receive it is between them and God. It doesn't matter who wants to hear it. I'll preach it to whoever. But that's what they have to do. They have to receive it. Be careful of agendas. The agendas of those who serve the devil and the agendas of those who say that they serve Christ. I want you to see something. Look at Matthew 24 and verse 4. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one what? deceives you. I've told you guys many times, where do the deceivers come from? The church. They come from within the church. Be careful. Be careful. We heard not too long ago, a few years ago maybe now, might even have been a little longer than that, one of the largest religious figures in the world uttered this statement. You do not have to believe in Jesus Christ to get to heaven. Everybody knows who said that, right? It was the Pope. Now, I don't know what Bible he read, 
But in my Bible, Jesus said what? I am the way. The what? Truth. And the what? Life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, I don't know how many Catholics there are in the world. I know it's hundreds of millions, but I don't know if it's reached a billion. It might be more than that. I don't know. But can you imagine, by the words of one individual, having that much, I guess the word might be control over a religious group? Deception comes from within the church, guys. Be careful. You were born for such a time as this. You were born to understand these principles. You were chosen. You were chosen to be born in such a time as this. And do you guys know what time it is? It's time to discern. It's time to discern. We have to figure out what's going on. I said on Wednesday night, and I'll say it to you guys, and I'm being dead, dead serious when I say this. Do you want to see something supernatural? The world's idea has been pushing this narrative to you that something supernatural has to be something that just blows your mind, completely freaks you out. Act of God type stuff, what they'll tell you in the world, right? The sky is opening up. Jesus appearing in the sky. These huge biblical things that we think we need to see in order for it to be supernatural. Do you want to see something supernatural? Go home. Turn on the news. What you see going on in the world right now, it's supernatural. Matthew 24 is playing out like they're reading from a script. Because you know why? They are. The devil. There's a reason why Jesus said the things that he said in Matthew 24. But see, there are voices from the past, from our founding fathers. They were spoken so clearly of a nation that they were trying to form that had this reverent fear of the Lord. And they weren't voices of rebellion as the modern church will teach. Let me just give you a little brief thing here on authority quick. I think next week we may revisit the whole authority. Well, not we're going to do the July 4th thing, but maybe we'll go into biblical authority. But let me just give you something this morning for all of you. Romans 13, that's where we get this idea of biblical authority. People will tell you all the time what it says, right? All authority comes from God. I heard somebody tell us in a class one time, even evil authority. And the Holy Spirit got a hold of me. I covered my face and I was like, mmm, 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 mmm. What do we talk about? God is what? Good. If God, only good comes from God, how do you think evil authority that's going to oppress his people, how, how do you think that came from God? Newsflash, it didn't. See, the only authority, the only pertinent authority is God. So if people aren't operating, that when they're operating in authority, it's no authority at all. It's men doing what men do and screwing everything up like we've always done. From day one. Right? Adam and Eve. Right? The joke. You guys have heard it before here. Eve ate us out of house and home. <laughs> right? No? You guys aren't cherry today? All right. <laughs> Apparently Eve ate us out of house and home. But she was deceived. So I always say it like this. The devil lied. But did he lie? No. He lied, but he didn't lie. He deceived. He deceived Eve, did he not? And of course, Adam, whose job was to take care of everything that went on in the garden, right? Mom, as my cousin would say. He's standing right next to Eve. And when God says, what did you do? What's the first thing that Adam does? Blame him! Blame God! He said, the woman you gave to me, gave me of the apple I ate. How about Cain and Abel? Remember after Cain killed Abel? And God comes and starts talking to him? Remember how Cain was? And he says, where's your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? Oh. What was this dude thinking? To talk to God like that, Right? Man has been screwing this up from the first and second generations, and it has gone straight downhill 
ever since. Right? Remember when God hit the reset button with Noah? Oh, you're my faithful. We'll take care of this. You guys are going to be good. Right? No. People mocking him and all this stuff. So what was God's sign that he would never destroy the earth by a flood again? The rainbow. We saw that symbol hijacked, didn't we? Yep. We're still in Pride Month. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? All right. But, oh, I could go on to that forever, but we'll just let that die right there. But what do these voices from the past say? The foundation of this country, though, is clearly spelled out from the words of uh, a guy by the name of William Bradford. Does everybody know who he was? He was the first governor of the Plymouth Colony, founded in 1620. And this is what he said. They cherished a great hope and an inward zeal of laying a good foundation for the advancement of the gospel of Christ in the remote parts of the world. That was what they wanted to do when they came here. It was to bring the gospel into the remote parts of the world. See, it's very evident that the men and women who laid the foundation for this nation were men and women who had a fear of the Lord. Look at these quotes, though, from our founding fathers and some of the national leaders from that time. George Washington once said, It is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. Does that put you into his perspective a little bit of how he was doing this? In his farewell speech in 1796, he said, Of all habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. How true is that? I think a few weeks ago I said a nation is only as strong as its church within it. Think about it. Think about that. George Washington was a man of prayer who could grasp the heart of God. When I say that, when I say that, I mean he got God. He understood God. He prayed. One of his prayers, this is what he said. Direct my thoughts and words and work. <clears throat> Wash away my sins in the immaculate blood of the Lamb and purge my heart by the Holy Spirit. Daily frame me more and more into the likeness of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Quite poetic, huh? What a lot of people fail to understand is that all the colleges within the colonies back then were Christian colleges. When you went to college, do you know what you went to college for? Theology. You were a minister when you came out. All of our founding fathers that had been college educated were ministers. If they went on to be lawyers or anything else, they had to train in that profession after college. But think about how young these men were when they began to found this nation. You know, when we went to Colonial Williamsburg, we were talking about Thomas Jefferson. If you mention Thomas Jefferson in Colonial Williamsburg, they kind of laugh at you because he was a nobody. He was at William and Mary when most of this was going on. The only reason why he became so prolific and in the spotlight was because of the man that he was studying to be an attorney with. What was his name? Wit. 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 Yeah. The original founding fathers, there were some guys you never even heard their names. Peyton Randolph. How many of you guys have ever heard that name? But do you want to know what they call him? The original founding father. Everything for the Revolutionary War was being plotted in his dining room. About what? A couple hundred yards from the governor's palace? We stood in that room. It still brings tears to my eyes to know that they sat there and thought about this stuff, plotted this revolution under the very nose of the British. It was less than 100 yards to their armory. His house sat right in the center of Williamsburg. And the founding fathers walking in and out like nothing's wrong. Do you think that God might have had a hand on that? Because the British were all over everything. Of course God had a hand in it. But see, with a prayer like that, does that sound somebody? Does that sound like somebody who doesn't know God? Oh, he knew God, and God knew him. Thomas Jefferson, the guy that everybody likes to talk about how Thomas Jefferson wasn't a Christian. Sure, in his early days, Thomas Jefferson used to rip the pages out of the Bible that he didn't believe. Yeah. What they, kind of like a little kid. Remember how, you, how little kids were? Right? What are they, if you're talking to them, what do they do? La, 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 la. Can't hear it. It's not happening. Or what do they do? Ooh. Right? If I don't see it, it's not happening. 
Thomas Jefferson said this, God gave us liberty, and can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis? I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. God's justice will not sleep forever, guys. He knew the need of the nation to walk in this reverent fear of the Lord and to live with a biblical understanding of what it means to live in that fear. As a nation and as an individual, God's justice will not sleep forever. And we are about to see that justice manifest. Trust me. Trust me. These Supreme Court decisions that you see now, the whisper of patriotism in the air, you're seeing a clear division of who is on which side of the fight. We're going to take a look at Psalm 33. We're going to read the whole thing. I might stop in here and explain a couple things to you. But this title of this, this psalm is this. The sovereignty of the Lord in creation and history. Listen to what David writes down here. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make melody to him with an instrument of ten strings. Do you guys know why it's ten strings? Why he said that? The number 10 is perfection. All right? Just so you get an idea. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. For the word of the Lord is right and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Do you think that that might be... Well, let me say it this way. It's not a coincidence. How the, how's that? It's not a coincidence that you see there in verse 8, let all the earth fear the Lord. These men are talking about the reverent fear of the Lord that they had when they formed this nation. In Matthew 24, towards the end, they, the disciples are asking about when will these things happen? Right? Jesus tells them what's going on. He said, but the end is not yet. The end will not become until the gospel has been preached to every nation. See, the God isn't the God of America. God isn't the God of the UK. God isn't the God of Mexico. God is the God of all creation. And that's what triggers this whole rapture. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Let me ask this question. If God wasn't seeking to have the whole world recognize that he is a loving God and loves every single person in this world, would he be a very good God if that wasn't found in his word? That the gospel needed to be preached to every creature? To all nations? Not really, which is why it's there. It's why it's there. The whole world is to love him and stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The Lord brings the counsel of the what? Nations to nothing. Let me ask you this question. The United States, we've been kicking tail and taking names for what? Almost 250 years, Right? The Supreme Court decisions that came out the other day, what's that dude's name, Macron? Started criticizing the Supreme Court decision. Hey, Macron, newsflash, we're Americans. We don't care what you think. You see all the prime ministers of who, all these nations saying, oh, this is terrible. Hey, guess what? We're Americans. We don't care. This is a Christian nation. We follow God's word here. We don't care what the rest of you do. I seem to remember a time not in the too far distant past. It was a little conflict we know as World War II. The entire European continent was being conquered by someone whose primary goal was to what? Eradicate the Jews. That was his whole premise. The rest is just a byproduct of that. And it wasn't until the United States got involved in that conflict and brought God's word with them that the European continent was set free. Think about it. Think about it. Do you think that would have happened without the grace of God upon the United States? You guys know a little part of history? You want to hear a little part of history this morning? I got a little time. 
If you don't, I won't tell you. Nobody was eager to hear it. Okay. The night before the invasion of D-Day, out on D-Day, Rommel, the Panzer General, the, the, the one that controlled all their tank divisions, wanted to move their pan, his Panzer divisions to Normandy. He knew something was up. Rommel was not allowed to move those Panzer divisions without Hitler's say-so. They could not find Hitler the night before the invasion. If those panzers had been near those beaches on D-Day, it would have been a slaughter. Trust me, guys. It wasn't much less than a slaughter that we took those beaches. We had a toehold. That toehold was by the grace of God. Think about the things that have happened. I can tell you stories about how when we went to Williamsburg, the entire Continental Army and the French Army marched into Yorktown under horrific storms that were going on, set their battle lines at 800 yards, which is standard for the time, mortars and cannons all ready. It rained and thundered and lightning. It was terrible. That night, Washington ordered all battlements to be moved forward another 200 yards. It still continued to rain and thunder and lightning under fog. The British didn't know that they were there. So Washington ordered, ordered them to advance. I think they finally got to within 200 yards of Yorktown. They never knew they were there. And it was where their greatest general, Great Britain's greatest general was, and Washington knew that if he defeated him, it was over. Washington ordered them to within 200 yards of Yorktown. When they were ready for battle, the sun came up the next morning. The birds were chirping. Unicorns were grazing in the field. You catching my drift here? It was the perfect day. And the British woke up and looked out on the field and said, <gasps> I'm sure that's literally what happened, right? And Washington said, surrender now, no blood needs to be shed. The answer was no. Now, I don't know if you guys know anything about mortars, but they're to be fired in the air, and they fragment, and then they explode over there. They were so close. This was less than point-blank range for mortars. Washington ordered the cannons and the mortars pointed directly into Yorktown and began to fire into the fort. Imagine shrapnel flying everywhere. Do you want to know what their general did, Cornwallis? Jumped off the cliff and held and, uh, hid in a cave by the bay. When they got down to the bay, what did they see in the bay? The French fleet. He let the battle go on. And then mercifully he surrendered. And Washington accepted his surrender. Think about these things that go on, guys. Think about these things. It's God's grace. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to no effect. We're Americans. It doesn't matter. We follow God's word here. We don't care what other nations do. Look what he says next. He makes the plans of the people of no effect. Boy, we see a lot of plans of the people out there, don't we? Did you hear about that group Jane's Revenge? That was supposed to blow up all these churches all over the place on their night of rage? But you're not hearing it in the media. Do you want to know why this didn't happen right away? I still talk to the Patriot groups. Patriots went to the churches all around this country and sat in the parking lot to make sure nothing happened. But you won't hear about that on the news. What you'll hear about is how finally things people think they can go back to normal. And that's when the devil will strike. See, you don't hear the truth anymore. Which is why I tell you the truth here on Sundays. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Bless, this is what we just read. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people he has chosen as his own inheritance. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men from the dwelling pla or from the, uh, the place of his dwelling. He looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. 
He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. Do you really want to hear, where were you? Think about this. No king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. Do you know what verse 17 really means is? What, what this meaning is? You can't run. There is no running from this. There is no hiding from this. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who what? Fear him. And those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. It is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us just as we hope in you. King David there illustrates to us the divine providence of Almighty God. That's what he's doing for all the earth. America needs to take heart to not only what King David said here, but also to what the founding fathers knew as the absolute truth. The counsel of the Lord is greater than the counsel of men. Why do you think I pray the things I do about our elected officials? Are we supposed to pray for those in authority? Absolutely. We are. We pray that they receive the Lord. We pray that they seek Him in all their decisions. But guess what? If they don't, we want them replaced with men and women who do. Do we not? I, see, I say women all the time. Do you ever see some of our elected officials? Do you ever see the men get up there? And what do they do? And what do you want to do? You ever see some of these elected ladies get up there? Woo! The mama bear comes out. You guys ever see, uh, what's her face, Lauren Bobert? Bobear, I don't know how you say her last, but you ever hear see her talk? When she gave her speech on the whole gun thing, and she goes, like, just like this, she gets up there and she goes, I would like to start this morning by telling my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, thank you. Thank you for everything that you've done because you've advanced gun sales and gun rights further than anybody else by yourself, single-handedly. See, these ladies tell it like it is, and they're not afraid. I always say that the women are the more faithful of our species, and it's very, very true. See, as I said, Christians know what it must be, what it has to be in order for this nation to be a Christian nation, to receive the blessings that we've seen. And we also know that as individuals, we've inherited this mighty plan, plans for a future and as a hope, as the Bible tells us. When we do this, we're blessed with His protection, His guidance, and His provision. Amen? Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. A man named Ross once said, when a nation and his people walk in obedience, there is an unspeakable joy. How much joy do you see in the country right now? I'm not seeing any at the moment. Right? How true is that? How true is that? Take a look around, guys. The answer should be very clear to you at this moment. People doing it the devil's way instead of God's way. Or as we're talking about, the American way, which is God's way. They are seeking to kill this nation. Make no mistake. Have you ever seen a time where people are making decisions that are affecting the people of this nation so horribly and they don't care? And they play it off like they are. Like it's just, it's just great. Well, we know it's not great. <coughs> If I pulled my pockets out right now, there'd be nothing but lint hanging out of them. Why? Because it's costing us an extra, what is it now, like $450 a month to go to the grocery store? Look, I grew up in the 70s. I was little, but I remember the gas lines. You guys remember? You remember that, right? Remember sitting in the line with your parents? I used to that. Yeah, there you go. Understand? I can remember sitting in the car with my grandmother for hours. To get, what was it, five gallons of gas or something? It was, it was, a, ra it was a rationing thing. And it went by your license plate. Every those, other day. Every, yeah. Those days aren't too far off, guys. We see our blessings for keeping God's word that we saw in our, open, in our opening scripture. Look at Exodus 19 and verse 5. 
this gives us a clear promise. It says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all people, for all the earth is mine. That wasn't just for the Jews. We're grafted in now. Those of us who keep his word, we are his people. You know, as I said the other day, if you want truth and be able to reference the truth, to read it and hold it, you better get it in hardcover. Guys, you are not going to be able to find the Word of God the way it is today. Get off of this for your Bibles. Get this. I can't tell you the number of Bibles that are in our house. Right? Why? You need them. Pastor Nicky, you guys know I'm a Bible nerd, right? I read my scripture, then I read Matthew Henry commentary, just to make sure that I'm in line with where, you know, I think the, the Bible's going. Pastor Nicky bought me his commentary. It's all hardcover. It's about this wide. And I said, man, if we ever have to bug out, I'm going to have a problem. i got to pack all my books. I won't have to pack guns because I don't. guns are bad. Guns are bad. Just for the record. In case anybody asks for my sermon one day. Right? Well, to pack anything except my books. Look, I'm not going anywhere. Right? Why? Because you have to have faith that the Lord is going to take care of you. Amen? He's going to take care of every single one of us. Right? But think about this. The written words of our founding fathers, if you go online nowadays to find something, it's amazing how Google just makes the words of the Founding Fathers disappear. They didn't say that. They were slave owners. They did this. They did that. Look, guys, are men perfect? No. We've been messing stuff up, like I said, since the beginning. Right? But if you want something that you can reference, you better get it in hardcover. The prophet Isaiah is a truth that affects all the nations on the earth. He wrote in Isaiah 4, uh, 52, 10, The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Guys, the whole world is going to see the salvation of Almighty God. Is everybody going to be saved? No, but everybody will see it. Do you understand that? The world is going to see it. When we get raptured out of here, there will be those people who say, oh, wow. Wow. This whole thing about Jesus was right. The world's going to say the aliens took us. But those who love us, is going to, they're going to know a whole different story. Now, will they receive the Lord? The Bible tells us that there will be a great number that come out of the tribulation, but they're not saved. There's a difference. See, we're saved from wrath. They're not. They will go through it, sadly. But will we see them in heaven? Yeah, we will. We will, because they've received the Lord. How good is God? See, it's not like you have to be, in order to get in it, you got to be in it for the rapture, right? But why not get raptured out of here? Why would you want to be tortured? Why would you want to have all these things happen to you? It's bad enough now. What do people say? Oh, you're one of those weirdos that goes to the ICC, right? You guys have heard that saying, right? Man, you're with that, you go with the, the, that pastor, that nut job over there, right? Look, guys, it is what it is. I'd rather be counted with God than counted with the devil. Amen? Luke testified to the ministry of John the Baptist here. He says the same things as Isaiah said. Look at Luke 3, 6. And all the people will see God's salvation. I just explained it to you. God's deliverance of Israel in the past, present, and future will cause all nations to acknowledge the Lord. I keep telling you guys, I tell everybody this, keep your eyes on Israel. What's going on in Israel is the barometer for the world. The rest of it doesn't matter. Russia and the Ukraine doesn't matter. The scandalous garbage that goes on over there, three years ago they were the most corrupt government in the world, and now all of a sudden we're sending them billions upon billions upon billions. You wonder why we got nothing in our pocket? Keep sending billions to do nothing. Right? Keep your eyes on Israel. The rumblings of how Iran says they don't have a right to exist. And how Israel basically says, really? Go 
28. Right? What is Israel basically saying? Bring it. If you guys have never heard the accounts of the Six-Day War, well, I can, I can tell you this. Actually, Matt and you and I were, and Matt and Tara talk about this. You can't find them anymore. They're being removed from history. How the hand of God was reported by even the Syrian pilots said, we don't know what happened. We saw the Israeli fighters. We outnumbered them 10 to 1. And all of a sudden, we saw a hand appear in the sky and swatted us out of the air like we were gnats. The Egyptian army was advancing on the Israelis. They outnumbered them 10 to 1 or better or more. All kinds of heavy artillery. And the Israelis were standing there knowing that Almighty God was with them. You know what the Egyptians said? They didn't know what it was. They saw these soldiers with fire surrounding them all behind the Israeli army. They were so frightened they left their artillery and tanks and ran in the opposite direction. What did the Israelis do? Ran, grabbed their artillery and their tanks, turned it back on them and started shelling them as they retreated. Guys, get it in hardcover if you ever want to reference this stuff. But these powerful voices from our past speak of the hope for every nation to learn about this stuff, to learn about God's salvation. They speak of the benefits of doing these things. Proverbs 18 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. But what do people the world over do? What do they do instead? Instead of running to the Lord, they run where? From the Lord. God already knows you, or knows you messed up. All he wants you to do is fess up to it. That's it. Our Bible tells us in Psalm 20 and verse 2, May he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. But that's that inheritance that I keep talking about. Psalm 91 and verse 4 says, He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. See, the God is a God of all sufficiency for everyone. For everyone. Matthew Henry said it like this, As they diligently seek His will for them, through the counsel of His word, they enjoy His attributes, have authority under His titles, and embrace His covenant, and cling to His promises. <clears throat> there was a guy, he was a Dutch watchmaker, his uh, name was Cor uh, Corey Ten Boom, and he helped Jews escape the Nazis during World War II. You don't really hear about him a lot, because we always hear about who? Anne Frank, right? The Diary of Anne Frank. But this is what he did as well. And um, they understood this truth. I actually think it was a woman. Yeah, I think it was a woman. Yeah, it was a woman. But she said this, When Jesus takes your hand, he keeps you tight. When Jesus keeps you tight, he leads you through your whole life. When Jesus leads you through your life, he brings you safely home. How cool is that? From over here all the way to home. And what was she doing? trying to get the Jews away, home, right? Away home. Sam Adams, for you ladies who love romance and love, if you ever have a chance, read the letters between Samuel Adams and his wife Elizabeth. They're cool. They're amazing. I couldn't imagine being separated from Pastor Nikki for very long. These guys spent more time apart than they did together, all right? But their love was so strong. Look at what he wrote to his wife. This was the day after Christmas in 1776. And this is how he wrote to his wife. Let us secure his favor, and he will lead us through the journey of this life. He spoke to his wife about godly principles. Men, how often do you talk to your wives about God, about the love he has, the love you have for her? See, the, the voices of our founding fathers tell us to run to the Lord. And we will be safe if we're at the center of His will. Those same voices urge us to intercession for the Lord. You guys know this scripture a lot. Right? We've seen it a lot. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. How much did we see this through the pandemic? How much did you see this scripture? It was all over the place. Now let me, let me throw a little background into this. What did they immediately try to do during the pandemic? Close the church. Yet people were screaming this from the rooftops. 
See, pastors should have had enough will within them to continue preaching the Word of God and be in their churches. But they kowtowed. Look what it says. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Did they do that? No. They ran and hid. Pastors should have been in the pulpits telling their people, speak the word of God over your situation, over your life, over your family, over this sickness, over this nation, and we will be healed. But it didn't happen. Which is why we find ourselves in the position we do today. Let me tell you something. I don't care whether people like this or not. Thank God for President Trump. Thank God that he put those justices on the court when these cases were coming through. Because without it, we wouldn't see the whispers of patriotism that we're seeing now. Does America need to repent? <sighs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Take a look around. Take a look around. You tell me what you think. Stop and think about the loud, ignorant voices of today, as well as the voices of the past. What do we see going on in the nation right now? It's like watching a bunch of petulant children who don't get their way, scream and cry and hold their breath until they get their ice cream. You know what I say? Hold your breath. Because when you pass out, oh, I'll pray for you. But this is what's going to happen. I'm going to step right over you while I continue the work of the ministry. Amen? <sighs> How often have we heard unbelievers try to school believers? They read one verse of their Bible and they're an expert. Right? I don't even want to say their Bible because they don't read it. They just want to tell you what it means. How often do we see the world, this nation even, trying to tear down what the founding fathers did? Are men perfect? I just said it. No, they're not. But they built this nation on biblical principles. These people who tear down the Word of God, who tear down the foundations of this nation, guys, they're evil. They serve their father, the devil. And I'm going to tell you something right now. Avoid them at all costs. Avoid them at all costs. Pastor, how can you say that? We've got to preach the gospel to them. Outside of preaching the gospel to them, the Bible tells us something very important about them. What does light have to do with dark? What does the believer have to do with the unbeliever? Paul said that, right? The guy who got the straight download from Jesus on how to preach the gospel. You are to have nothing to do with them outside of that. Outside of that. Now, how many of us have friends that are unsaved? You can raise your hand. We all do. We all do. But see, what we have to do is this. When your unsaved friend says, it was a rough week. I'm pretty mad. You just run out and rob a bank. Now, what do you say? This is how I say it. Amen. And they're like, oh, we should rob a bank? No. You just said amen. It's bad. We shouldn't go rob a bank, though. <laughs> See, but I said amen. So what do they think you're coming from right away? You got Jesus on your mind. What is it? How's that phrase go? I got my mind on my money and my money on my mind. I got my Jesus on my mind and my Jesus. What? Jesus on my mind and my. Something you guys know what I mean, right? Whew, tongue twister right here today. I can't get it right. But they know where you're coming from, right? What do you have to do with them? Are you not tweaking the gospel there a little bit every time you talk to them? Right? How many of us have? We have them. We all have them. <laughs> guys. Avoid these people. Think about these things. We see those experts who read their Bibles today. Right? The ones who read it from a historical perspective. And what do you hear them say on all the documentaries? I've studied the Bible extensively for 37 years. I know every word in there. I know what the Bible means. Really? Because unless you come up with the one understandable truth is that this is a book about love. You haven't learned a thing. And you know nothing of its contents. 
Well, they don't like to hear that, though, do they? They don't like to hear that. I'm sure you've heard people say, you may even thought of yourself, that America is no longer a Christian nation. And it's easy to see why people would say these things. But we have to know what history tells us. Have we seen this morning, or as we've seen this morning, we've seen that our Christian faith has founded this nation from its inception, and even in Plymouth, or uh, in a colony of Plymouth in 1620. You know, the claims, even know that we know these things, the claims that America is no longer a Christian nation persist. And often those claims aren't refuted. And it's due to widespread lack of knowledge of America's history in this foundation that was laid by the fathers. Maybe, really, what it is is these claims fail to share the real idea of what a Christian nation is. David Barton from Wall Builders said this. He wrote a book. It's called, Is America No Longer a Christian Nation? And this is what he said in it. Regardless of what today's Americans think, it is unquestionable that four previous centuries of American leaders strongly disagree with any statement that presents America as not being a Christian nation. And he went on to say, the voices from our past, our presidents, legislatures, and court decisions speak powerfully about America being a Christian nation. Research can tell you what a Christian nation is, and a Christian nation is not one in which all citizens are Christians. Neither are the laws required to be in accord with Christian theology or where all the leaders are Christians. Now, people might hear me say that, of what, uh, quoting him, and be like, Pastor, what are you doing? That's like going against what we're talking about here this morning. He's referencing something that... Uh, Supreme Court Justice David Brewer said. Now understand this. David Brewer was born in 1837 and passed away in 1910. Okay? So this was much later than the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. And this is what he said. In what sense can America be called a Christian nation? Not in the sense that Christianity is the established religion or that the people are in any manner compelled to support it. On the contrary, the Constitution specifically provides that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Neither is it a Christian in the same sense that all its citizens are either in fact or named Christians. On the contrary, all religions have free scope within our borders. Numbers of our people profess other religions, <clears throat> and many reject all. Nor is it Christian in the sense that a profession of Christianity is a condition of holding office or otherwise engaging in public service or essential to recognition either politically or socially. In fact, the government as a legal organization is independent of all religions. Nevertheless, we con this is where this all he brings this all together. Listen to what he says. Nevertheless, we constantly speak of this republic as a Christian nation, in fact, as the leading Christian nation of the world. What's he getting at? It's citizens. Where, where are we made up? What are we comprised of? Do we believe in God's word? Are we all Christians? He's saying it doesn't have to be, but we all believe in God. See, the Founding Father is something that people don't really think of, in all their wisdom and all the guidance that God had on, upon their lives and in the, in the founding of the documents in this country, it never occurred to them that people wouldn't love Jesus. Think about that. It never occurred to them. So when they said freedom of religion, sure. Why? Because they knew that 99.99% believed in a loving God. It never occurred to them. See, so I have to ask, what are these experts out there that are telling us this, that, and the other thing, basing their opinions on? It's not fact. They seem to like bring it up a lot now, right? We're not interested in facts anymore. We're interested in the truth. Well, they make the truth whatever they want the truth to be. It doesn't matter whether the facts do or don't support it. See, you can't legislate morality, guys. We've seen that. We've seen that. You can't legislate morality. And you can't force anyone to be a good Samaritan. You cannot beat someone over the head with a Bible and hope that they receive Jesus. What are they going to do? They're going to tell you, yeah, I believe in Jesus, so you won't hit them over the head with the Bible again. The only way to reach them is through love. See, free will is how this gets done. Free will prevents us from forcing the Ten Commandments on anybody. 
free will for, uh, uh, prevents us from doing this. But the, the re excuse me, the reference within our founding documents, and they have framed what we call the American way. American presidents have affirmed this. Legislators have affirmed this. People from all over have affirmed this. Let me give you some quotes, and then we're going to wrap this up. Thomas Jefferson told a friend, no nation has ever existed or been governed without religion, nor can it be. The Christian religion is the best religion that has been given to man, and I, as chief magistrate of this nation, am bound to give it the sanction of my example. John Adams wrote to Thomas Jefferson on June 28, 1813, the general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. Think about this, guys. If the founding fathers thought for one moment that when they were fighting against the king, because now remember what we talked about, Romans 13, right? This idea of biblical authority. He was the authority, was he not? If they thought for one moment that they were rebelling against God by doing that, they never would have done it. And in one of these quotes, you're going to see what he says. Theodore Roosevelt, or what, what that means. Theodore Roosevelt said this, the teachings of the Bible were so interwoven and entwined with our whole civic and social life that it would literally be impossible for us to figure to ourselves what life would be if these teachings were removed. Woodrow Wilson said America was born a Christian nation. America was born to exemplify that devotion to the elements of righteousness which are derived from the revelations of Holy Scripture. Herbert Hoover said, American life is built and can alone survive upon the fundamental philosophy announced by the Savior 19 centuries ago. Consider the lack of knowledge of these other people that are going on about how we're not a Christian nation. See, the people of this nation have to have the same understanding that these men and women had. See, there was a guy by the name of Josiah Bartlett who was an original signer of the Declaration of Independence. Listen to what he said. Called on the people to confess before God their aggravated transgressions to implore his pardon and forgiveness through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ. That the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ may be known to all nations, pure and undefiled religion universally prevail, and the earth be filled with the glory of God. That was from uh, the proclamation day for a fasting of prayer in 1792. A people of God who are willing to confess their sins are able to withstand all the attacks of the enemy. Look what Matthew 16, 18 says. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Oh, that, well, that's not up there. That's scripture. Guys, this whole idea of what we have to do as a nation starts with us. That Congress, U.S. Uh, House Judiciary Committee in 1854 wrote this. Imagine something like this coming out of Congress today. Had the people during the revolution, oh, this is the one I was telling you about. Understand what they're saying. Had the people during the revolution had a suspicion of any attempt to war against Christianity, the revolution would have been strangled in its cradle. You understand what they're saying? If they thought for one second they were rebelling against God in doing what they did, it would have died. In this age, there can be no substitute for Christianity. Or Christianity That was the religion of the founders of the republic, and they expected it to remain the religion of their descendants. That came out of the report of the Committee of the House of Representatives made during the first session of the 33rd Congress in 1854. Can you imagine something like that coming out of Congress now? Well, we can't even have ministers go in and pray over Congress now without some kind of ridiculousness going on. Remember that guy not too long ago? praying over Congress, and he's praying his prayer, and all of a sudden he goes, Amen. <coughs> and a woman. And he ran off the stage. Let me ask you a question. What the heck does a woman mean? What does Amen mean? Amen is just a, 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 an affirmation that you're agreeing. Okay? So what is Amen? Or a, a woman? Amen has nothing to do with men. It has nothing to do with the narrative of white supremacy. It has nothing to do with male superiority. It has nothing to do with women's reproductive rights. Boy, they will just slam anything into there, right? And why did the dude run after he said a woman? You want to know why? Because he thought Pastor Kyle was standing there and I was going to run him down and beat him with a Bible. 
I feel like saying to these people, where are you getting this from? It's not from the Bible. Holy moly. Can you say that in church? I just did. Yeah, well, I said <laughs> These decisions we've seen from the Supreme Court, guys, they're whispering that this is a Christian nation. See, in Psalm 128, verse 1, we see this. Blessed are all those who fear the Lord, who walk, God bless you, who walk in His ways. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your sons will be like olive shoots around your table. Thus is the man blessed who fears is the Lord. Psalm 34, verse 7 says this, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear Him, and He delivers them. Fear the Lord, you His saints, for those who fear Him lack nothing. The blessings of the Lord were upon this nation, and men and women who feared the Lord. I'm going to tie this up right here. We're going to end it. John Dickinson, he was a signer of the Constitution. He knew this truth. Look at how his last will and testament is formed here. Now, when we go to, or actually the modern rendition of last wills and testaments, what do they say? I, blah, 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 being of sound mind and, I don't know, whatever the rest of that commercial is, right? I bequeath blah, 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 and blah, 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 and blah, 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 and blah, 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 Rendering thanks to my Creator for my existence and station among His works, for my birth in a country enlightened by the gospel and enjoying freedom, and for all His other kindness. To Him I resign myself humbly, confiding in His goodness and in His mercy through Jesus Christ for the events of eternity. That's how you do it, right? But do you understand? Remember when I told you about a well formed prayer? What happens first in a well formed prayer? Praise and worship. And then you make your petitions known. He was doing the same thing there. His last will and testament was almost like a prayer, guys. See, that's how we should live our lives. So let me accept, I just say this. Revival is in the air. We cannot let it die. Even if this nation is used just one more time for something awesome, we have to keep it up. And as we begin to take the republic back, the kingdom of God will spread more and more quickly, and so doing the return of our Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 Did you guys get something? Amen. I hope you did. We never end a service here without saying our salvation prayer. So, as we say this, in the past few weeks I've been talking about this, I want you to think of somebody as we make our confessions today, who isn't saved, who you want to see saved. And as we pray it here in this sanctuary, I want you to think about them and coming to the, the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. For those who might be watching online who have never asked Jesus Christ into their hearts, I ask you to do that today. I invite you to do that today. If maybe you're watching online, either now or later, and maybe you have said something like this, prayed something like this, but you're not living your life for Jesus right now, I invite you to rededicate your life to Him. And it's a simple prayer that we pray. And is it really that simple? Yes, but you have to mean it. So everybody pray with me. Everybody repeat after me. My dear God in heaven, I believe today that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that He died on the cross and that He rose on the third day and sits at your right hand. Lord Jesus, Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. And thank you for receiving me today into your kingdom and for giving me of all my sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Is it that simple? Yep. You just have to mean it. Our tithes and offerings, you guys know how we go. The basket's over on the side. But if you're watching online and you would like to sow into this ministry or tithe into this ministry, whatever word you want to use, it can, uh, you can send your uh, donations to Impact Christian Church, P.O. Box 141, Augusta, New Jersey, 07822. You can go on our website, prayloveimpact.org, click on the Give button and fill out a form there. Or you can download our app so you can stay informed of what's going on here at the church and you can give on there too. 
But here at this church, we talk about our tithes and offerings. We talk about how the Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. And I ask every single person here, every Sunday, that before they sow into the ministry to seek God, what he would want them to sow into this ministry. That's the way we do it. God doesn't want you, as the scripture tells us, not to do it grudgingly or sparingly or out of necessity or some duty that you may feel that you have. You know, Pastor Nikki always used to freak out when I would say this and she would, you know, say, don't say that. But you know what? The Holy Spirit wants me to say it. Don't let a guy stand in, or a woman stand in a pulpit and tell you what to do to guilt you out of uh, into, into doing it. That's not how God wants you to do it. And there's a blessing that comes when you give in this manner. And we see this in 2 Corinthians 9. And it starts in verse 10. It says this. Then may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. While you're enriched in everything for all the reality which causes thanksgiving through us to God. For the administration of the service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. And by their prayer for you, who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray and then we'll fellowship. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message today. Father, I thank you for the people that were here, that are listening, for those people who will eventually listen. Father, I pray that it touched your people in a special way, that their hearts be open, that people who never received your son come to the saving knowledge of him. Father, we thank you for that. We pray that so fervently. That is our job, Father, as your people to just introduce more and more people to that that saving knowledge of your loving son father we thank you for him we thank you for the precious gift of the holy spirit and father i lift your people up before you father for protection in the physical the financial the emotional the mental whatever it may be that this crazy world throws at us father always remind us that we take up the shield of faith first according to your word that in faith we stand on your word and know that it will be done and in faith father in this nation we lift her up before you Father, use us again, even if it's only once more. Father, if the Lord is coming quickly or should he tarry, whatever it may be, we continue to lift this nation up before you that your arms be wrapped around her and guide her. We lift up its elected officials before you, Father, that they seek you first in all things. And if they don't, use us in a mighty way to remove them and put men and women in those positions who do seek you. So, Father, we thank you for those things. Anybody who's sick here or watching online who's not feeling good, whether it be emotionally or whatever it might be, physically, Father, we lift them up right, before, right now before you, and we break principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in the high places that might be gathering around them, forces that are working on them, coming against them. Father, they're broken right now in the name of Jesus Christ. We break the same in the name of Jesus Christ that might be plotting against and coming against this nation. And Father, we thank you for such a time as this, that you've chosen us to go forward to, with, the, with the message of your gospel. And we thank you, Father, and just always know that we love you, we honor and praise you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen.